Long ago, some wise thinkers, like Paul of Tarsus, looked into ancient texts and found something intriguing. In a passage from Deuteronomy, they saw a hint about crucifixion, a brutal punishment where someone is nailed to a cross. This text talked about hanging someone from a tree, which made them think about the awful practice of lynching or traditional hanging. Deuteronomy 21 verses 22 to 23. When someone is convicted of a crime punishable by death and is executed, and you hang him on a tree, his corpse must not remain all night upon the tree. You shall bury him that same day, for anyone hung on a tree is under God's curse. You must not defile the land that the Lord your God is giving you for possession. But there was a twist. In olden times, Jewish law only allowed a few ways to execute someone, stoning, burning, strangulation, and decapitation. So, what did hanging from a tree mean? Well, it turns out, they figured it was more about sending a message than the actual act. They thought it meant hanging up the body after death as a warning to others. Like saying, Look what happens if you break the rules! In some ancient writings, like the Aramaic Testament of Levi, there are clues about this too. It talks about God making things right and judging sins. It even mentions a story about Jonah who famously cried and pleaded for mercy. The message seems clear, don't hurt the weak or punish them cruelly, like with crucifixion. Don't let even a nail touch them. In ancient times, some rulers didn't shy away from using crucifixion as a harsh punishment. Take King Alexander Janius of Judea, for example. He's said to have crucified a whopping 800 rebels, who were thought to be Pharisees, right in the heart of Jerusalem. Even legends like Alexander the Great didn't hesitate to use this brutal method. After his siege of the city of Tyre, he crucified around 2,000 survivors, including the doctor who tried but failed to save his close friend Hephaestion. Some tales even suggest that Alexander had his own historian and friend, Callisthenes, crucified for daring to object to his adoption of Persian customs. And it wasn't just in the Middle East. In Carthage, crucifixion was a common punishment. They didn't discriminate either. Even generals who suffered big defeats could find themselves nailed to a cross. One of the earliest recorded instances of crucifixion goes way back to 522 BC. Herodotus tells us about Polycrates, the ruler of Samos, who was killed by the Persians and then had his dead body crucified. It's a grim reminder of how cruel punishment could be in ancient times. The ancient Greeks and Romans had a variety of ways to inflict pain and death, all falling under the term crucifixion. It wasn't just about nailing someone to a cross. It could mean impaling them on a stake, tying them to a tree, or affixing them to an upright pole. Seneca the Younger described the chilling diversity. Some were hung upside down, some were impaled in sensitive areas, and some had their arms stretched out on a crossbeam. In ancient Rome, Crucifixion wasn't just about punishment. It was a message to others. Victims were often left on display after death, serving as a warning. The whole point was to make the death slow, agonizing, and humiliating, as well as a public spectacle. That's where we get the term. Excruciating. Literally meaning. Out of crucifying. The methods of crucifixion varied widely depending on where and when it was practiced. But one thing was consistent. It was meant to be a horrifying and unforgettable deterrent. Some scholars have speculated that the Roman practice of crucifixion might have evolved from an older tradition called Arbori Suspendera, where people were hung on trees dedicated to underworld gods. However, this theory has been challenged by William A. Oldfather. He argues that the traditional Roman method of execution, known as Supplicium Mormiorum, involved hanging someone from a tree not associated with any specific gods, and then flogging them to death. Tertullian, a writer from the first century AD, does mention cases where trees were used for crucifixion, but Seneca the Younger used the term, infelix lignum, unfortunate wood, to refer to the crossbeam or the entire cross. Plautus and Plutarch also describe criminals carrying their own crossbeams to the upright poles, providing insights into how crucifixion was carried out in ancient times. After the Third Servile War, also known as the Slave Rebellion led by Spartacus, the Romans resorted to mass crucifixions to send a chilling message. Crassus, 
a Roman leader, ordered the crucifixion of a staggering 6,000 of Spartacus' followers who had been captured after their defeat in battle. In another grim episode during the siege that led to the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, Roman soldiers crucified Jewish captives before the city walls. Josephus, a Jewish historian, recounts that the soldiers, fueled by anger and hatred, cruelly nailed their victims in various positions, even finding it amusing. In some cases, the condemned were made to carry the crossbeam to the execution site. A full cross was incredibly heavy, weighing over 300 pounds, but the crossbeam was somewhat lighter at around 100 pounds. Tacitus, a Roman historian, mentions that Rome had a designated place for executions, located outside the Esquiline Gate, with a specific area reserved for crucifying slaves. Permanent posts stood ready, and the crossbeam, often with the condemned person already nailed to it, would be affixed to the post. It was a stark reminder of the ruthlessness of Roman rule. When it came to attaching the condemned to the cross, different methods were used. While some historical accounts suggest ropes were used, others mention nails and sharp materials. Josephus, recounting the siege of Jerusalem in 70 C, describes how soldiers, fueled by rage and hatred, cruelly nailed their victims to the crosses, almost as if it were a sick joke. Interestingly, objects like the nails used in crucifixions were sometimes believed to possess medicinal qualities and were sought after as amulets. It's a chilling reminder of how brutality and superstition often intertwined in ancient times. Crucifixion wasn't just about ending a life. It was about stripping away dignity and exposing the condemned to the utmost vulnerability. Despite how artists often portray figures on crosses with some form of covering, the truth was much harsher. Victims were usually stripped naked. Accounts from Seneca the Younger paint a grim picture, mentioning victims enduring unimaginable pain, like having a stick forced upwards through their groin. Even though crucifixion was a common practice in Roman times, it didn't escape criticism from some of Rome's most respected voices. Cicero, a renowned orator, didn't mince words when he described crucifixion as a most cruel and disgusting punishment. He even went as far as to say that the very mention of the cross should be banished from a Roman citizen's body, mind, eyes, and ears. To him, it was a crime against humanity, a heinous act that couldn't even be properly named. In his eyes, to bind scourge, or put to death a Roman citizen was bad enough, but to crucify them was beyond words. To expedite death and send a chilling message, it wasn't uncommon for the legs of those being crucified to be broken or shattered with an iron club, a brutal practice known as crurifragium. This was often done not only to those on the cross but also to slaves as a form of punishment. Breaking the legs not only brought about a quicker end to the suffering but also served as a deterrent to onlookers, warning them against similar actions. It was a grim reminder of the consequences of defying Roman authority. In a significant turn of events, Constantine the Great, the first Christian emperor, put an end to crucifixion in the Roman Empire in 337 AD. His decision was made out of reverence for Jesus Christ, the most famous victim of crucifixion. It marked a significant shift away from the brutal practices of the past and reflected the growing influence of Christianity in the empire. Crucifixion was designed to be a horrifying and public display of punishment, meant to inflict the utmost pain and shame imaginable. Originally reserved for slaves, it was later expanded to include citizens of lower classes, reflecting its brutal nature. The victims of crucifixion were stripped naked and left exposed for all to see. They were then subjected to a slow and agonizing death, deliberately drawn out to serve as a spectacle and a deterrent to others. Whether they were slaves, pirates, or enemies of the state, the intention was the same, to make an example of them to show what happened to those who dared to defy authority. It was a cruel form of justice, meant to strike fear into the hearts of all who witnessed it. Roman law was harsh, and it held entire groups accountable for the actions of individuals. For instance, if a slave killed their owner, all the owner's slaves could face crucifixion as punishment, regardless of their involvement. This meant both men and women were subjected to this brutal fate. Tacitus recounts a chilling incident in his annals. When Lucius Pedanius Secundus was murdered by a slave, 
some senators tried to spare the lives of the owner's 400 slaves, knowing among them were many women and children. Despite their efforts, tradition prevailed, and all were executed. Though evidence of female crucifixion is scant, the oldest known image of a Roman crucifixion possibly depicts a woman, whether real or imagined. Crucifixion was such a horrific and taboo subject in Roman society that few records exist. One documented case is that of Ida, a free woman, who was crucified on the orders of Tiberius. Her story serves as a haunting reminder of the brutality of Roman justice. The process of crucifixion was carefully orchestrated by specialized teams, typically led by a commanding centurion and his soldiers. It began with the condemned being stripped naked and scourged, a brutal act that caused them to lose a significant amount of blood and approach a state of shock. After the scourging, the convict would often have to carry the horizontal beam, called the patibulum, to the execution site, though not necessarily the entire cross. Along the way, they would be paraded through crowded streets, carrying a signboard called the titulus, which proclaimed their name and crime for all to see. Upon reaching the designated execution site, usually a highly visible location, the convict would be stripped of any remaining clothing and nailed to the cross while still naked. If the crucifixion took place at a permanent execution site, the vertical beam, called the stipes, might already be in place. In this case, the convict's wrists would be nailed to the patibulum, which would then be lifted and fastened to the stipes. The convict's feet or ankles would then be nailed to the upright stake. These nails were tapered iron spikes, approximately 5 to 7 inches long, with a square shaft about 3 eighths of an inch across. The titulus would also be affixed to the cross, ensuring that passers-by knew the person's name and crime as they hung in agony, maximizing the public impact of the gruesome spectacle. There was likely considerable variation in how prisoners were nailed to their crosses and how their bodies were positioned during crucifixion. Seneca the Younger vividly describes the diversity. Some victims were hung with their heads down, others had their private parts impaled, while some stretched out their arms on the crossbeam. Interestingly, for Jewish victims, it suggested that men were crucified with their backs to the cross, as commonly depicted, while women were nailed facing their crosses, perhaps with their backs to onlookers for modesty, or at least with the vertical beam providing some cover if viewed from the front. Such arrangements were unique to Jewish customs and weren't practiced elsewhere. To prolong the suffering and humiliation, some sources mention a seat fastened to the crossbeam, helping support the person's body and preventing death by asphyxiation. Justin Martyr refers to this seat as a cornu, or horn, leading some scholars to speculate it might have had a pointed shape, adding to the torment of the crucified person. This aligns with Seneca's observation of victims with their private parts impaled, suggesting the deliberate cruelty of the practice. In Roman-style crucifixion, death was often a slow and agonizing process, lasting up to several days. However, sometimes death was hastened by the actions of the guards overseeing the crucifixion. Roman guards were required to remain at the site until the victim had died, and they were known to speed up the process by breaking the victim's legs, stabbing them in the heart with a spear, delivering sharp blows to the chest, or even by lighting a fire at the foot of the cross to induce asphyxiation. Despite the potential for hastening death, the Romans often deliberately kept the victim alive for as long as possible, prolonging their suffering and humiliation to maximize the deterrent effect on others. This meant that corpses were typically left on the crosses to decompose and be consumed by scavenging animals, adding further indignity to the already horrific fate of the crucified. Thank you for your support.